to test this. So this will be uh, now uh, recorded, as you just heard, I think. And um, so I'm very happy to, to uh, present you our three uh, presenters. So we have uh, Stefan Leins from the University of Konstanz. He will add some, um, some uh, ESG uh, uh, investment vehicles in the global bank. We have uh, Lena Pellandini uh, Signani, uh, uh, who is speaking about how financial institutions uh, shape um, uh, social groups and class. She is from the University uh, uh, of uh, Swiss uh, Italian, uh, Swiss Italian, as uh, University of T from Ticino. <laughs> Sorry, what is the exact? <laughs> uh, University yeah. of, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, and they have. Uh, so they have <laughs> Sorry. They insist on using the Italian name, so uh, Svizzera Italiana. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, that, that was the term I was looking for. So, and we have uh, Fabian Fugo, <laughs> who is uh, from the University of Lausanne, who, is, who will speak about uh, uh, financialization in the uh, next uh, of the US. So, uh, we are very happy to have these three speakers. Uh, so, everybody will have about uh, 15 minutes to speak, and we will have then five to 10 minutes for a discussion. And if we have time in the end, we might even have a kind of a comparative uh, uh, discussion at the end or a, a discussion for last uh, question. So if you have questions, please um, raise your hand with the little hand sign afterwards. And I will um, I will also inform you, uh, 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 Lena, Stefan and uh, Fabia, uh, when you have still three minutes to talk so that you know that when, when, when to, to stop. And um, yes, we, we hope for a, a good discussion. And I present now the first uh, presenter, so Stefan Leins. He has a, a PhD in social, so, social anthropology from the University of Zurich. Uh, he has taught at the LSE, at the University of Zurich, and still some other universities in Switzerland and, and abroad. And he is now an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Constance. Um, he has published recently or two years ago or so, this, uh, this excellent book here, which is called Stories of Capitalism Inside the Role of Financial Analysts, where he uh, 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 reports his uh, anthropology uh, in a big Swiss bank. And I think what you are going to present today is also, as I understand it, part, uh, part of this. And uh, he's also interested in, in, in Islamic finance and currently working on a, on a, on a uh, project on networks of commodity trading. So uh, um, thank you very much for joining us, Stefan, and the floor is yours for about uh, 15 minutes. Okay, I will share my screen. Um, just a second. Here we go, you can see. You can hear me and see the screen, right? Okay, okay, so let's start. So thanks a lot for the invitation and for a great, um, great organization to Fabian Felix and Lena, Noe, Francois, you were all involved somehow. somehow. And it's, it's amazing to, to be able to be part of it, even though we don't get to see each other in person, but hopefully uh, that will be uh, possible someday and, and to, to chat a bit more informally about that. So um, what I'm going to talk to you is something which I published as a paper last year in Economy and Society with a similar title, Responsible Investing, uh, Investment, ESG and the Post-Crisis Ethical Order. And I thought it fits well the topic of the overall conference because it gives, or I hope that it gives a glimpse of how social, uh, uh, how topics of social justice and, uh, and on social and environmental concern are currently negotiated in financial market uh, contexts. Uh, so if you're interested in that, in that more thoroughly, I'll be happy to forward you the paper. You can look it up in, in, in last year's Economy and Society uh, issue number one. Um, so the, the, the basically the, the point of departure is that this course on responsibility and, 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 and sustainability is basically uh, almost everywhere to be 
found. So I give you a short quote from the Nestle homepage where Nestle writes, we believe that if we want to be successful in the long term, we must create value for our shareholders and society while also protecting the planet. So here you also have the, the social component as well as the environmental uh, component as part of their kind of message to the to the shareholders. Another one which is a bit provocative uh, in the context of, 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 of my choice because it's from Lockheed Martin, which is the biggest arms manufacturer, man, manufacturer on, on the world. So on their homepage, they write, uh, we have long been driven by the concept of sustainability, a paradigm of corporate social responsibility. So this is to be found on their, on their uh, particular website when they talk about their uh, sustainable or social uh, commitment. And then a, a third uh, quote that I wish to share with you is one from Goldman Sachs to, to also to show you that uh, how it is negotiated in, in, in the financial market context. So Goldman Sachs writes on their homepage, uh, within Goldman Sachs Asset Management, a group of senior professionals across various asset classes oversees the integration of responsible investment objectives. So um, what I'm trying to, to show you uh, with these three quotes and, uh, is that the, the addressing of, 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 of responsibility and the addressing of environmental and social concern is something that basically across all economic sectors and in particularly particular in financial markets uh, needs to be done by almost every every actor that's that, that's involved in this uh, in, in, in these economic and in these settings so it's clearly it clearly shift and shows a shift away from what uh, what uh, Milton Friedman coined in the seven, uh, 1970s, where he says, where he had that, uh, where, where, where he mentioned that the corporate social responsibility of a firm is to is to increase its profits. So that's that's a, one quote of him. Uh, another quote is that he. He once said that the business of business is business. So he clearly took the stance that uh, economic activities shouldn't be shouldn't bother be bothered with uh, social and environmental concern, but simply with the aim of uh, generate profit, increase profit, make their business as as the, the most prof profitable as possible. So what we see now. Uh, 40 and 50 years later is a radical shift that we are uh, uh, seeing an economic environment where these things have to be actively uh, addressed. So, oh, here we go. So I'm, I'm giving you a, a short note on, um, on my, my particular approach to this field. As Felix mentioned, I, I, I did my field work for, B, uh, for, my, for my PhD in a financial analysis department of a internationally operating Swiss bank. So the initial field work phase was from 2010 to 2012, so quite a while ago. But ever since, of course, I tried to keep up with the topic and the latest uh, development, but as, all of you that are uh, in, in a, in a uh, late doctoral phase or, or postdoc phase know uh, that the initial uh, uh, collection of data that you actually do for your PhD uh, uh, dissertation is, is probably the most productive one you will do throughout your academic career because you, you do have the time to to, to, to gather a lot of data. So I'm still kind of benefiting from that as well. So what I did with the with the agreement of the, or with the with the, um, with, with, with the consent of the, of the bank itself, which I'm calling Swiss Bank in, in, in my book and throughout my research, 
uh, I could do participant observation, informal talks, document an analysis. So this is a kind of a classical, really classical ethnographic research that I did. So even though it is, it might not be a classical ethno a field for anthropologists to 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 be in, uh, the methods were pretty classical in the sense that I just hung out with people, learned from them, talked to them, and tried to get their approaches, tried to observe and talk about their everyday practices and their everyday life. Um, so most of the things uh, that I did are, are now to be uh, are, are now published in the book, Stories of Capitalism, as Felix mentioned, which came out uh, three years ago now. Um, so what uh, during uh, during my during my field work I also encountered a lot of uh, discussions around social responsibility corporate social responsibility and then also the term ESG which I will talk about uh, in a minute and this hasn't been uh, discussed so much in detail in the book but I I, I, I use the opportunity to discuss it more now in, in this paper because it struck me as uh, something which is important or uh, could uh, need, needs to be told uh, or needs to be researched. And there's not a lot of, of research out there yet on, on, on that particular movement if you look at uh, in, in sociology or anthropology. There are, of course, uh, uh, papers out, but it's, it's, it's not so much. Uh, so, so this is uh, this is why I'm finding it interesting to talk about. Uh, so, what I what I've seen during my my initial research phase, where this uh, this course on ESG became quite popular, um, I, I I I saw kind of three phases of development, which I will uh, talk about. Now, so the first phase was, which I'm calling a bank, not a church. This is a, a, a quote from a financial analyst uh, who was talking about uh, SRI, which it's called as socially responsible investing, which is the attempt to um, practice or to be active as investor in the market uh, and consider certain social and environmental uh, concern while allocating um, allocating uh, capital to pro to particular uh, uh, asset classes or uh, financial products. So when I started my field work, people were quite uncomfortable with that idea. Um, and often they would tell me, uh, to, uh, the, the analysts uh, told me and also the client advisors told me, but this is not really our job. We are, as the quote says, we are not a judge. We, we, we don't look uh, to ideologically driven uh, things or value driven. And this is all their language basically. Uh, but we just, we, we simply, we want to focus on the economic and uh, Fin financial ele elements and, and components of our investments. Uh, so there was a lot of discomfort, but there was also a bit of enthusiasm um, among some of the financial market practitioners that really were looking for um, socially responsible investing. But somehow the concept of our SRI didn't really seem uh, to fit that particular field and even more importantly um, the the claims that were uh, done um, in in socially responsible investing didn't really uh, didn't really fit a particular technique of valuation or this was simply not developed uh, in, 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 a, in a first in a first uh, attempt so the second phase was really like the emergent emergence of, 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 of a thing called ERS, ESG. So ESG stands for environmental, so, social and governance related investing. And it really allowed to reframe our socially responsible investing in a very particular way. 
because rather than talking about social concerns in general or also environmental concerns in general, ESG uh, presented itself as a concept, it presented itself much more uh, in, a, in, a, in a valuation uh, type of, 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 of of, of rationale. So uh, what, what you see here in table one is an example of such an ESG framework where analysts would really go through certain issues, environmental uh, related, socially related and governance related, and then really kind of quantify in a very, in a very neutral as they would, uh, they would uh, perceive it in a very neutral way uh, evaluate companies uh, in, 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 in terms of their operations, what, what they contribute or what, what might be shortcomings on environmental concerns, social and governance uh, related uh, concern. And this, was, um, and this was something the financial analysts, they could, they could cope with in a much easier way because it gave them a framework which was comparable to the way they used to work uh, and, and, and something that didn't seem to them as value driven or ideologically driven but simply something like a like a like like, like a matrix where they can uh, uh, judge a company based on their what they call ESG performance. And once that uh, concept became more popular, there was an in, very much of an increased at, uh, attendance and, and people were really started uh, to, 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 to look on, on, on these ESG performances. And it got much more popular after I left the field and is now something which almost at least every larger bank offers to its, uh, its clients. So the final breakthrough, I would say, of the ESG concept was really the, 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 the third phase where they started or financial analysts could start to, to frame ESG data as not something which is only of concern to people that share a certain concern on social relations or environmental relations, but simply also for people that just wanted to they just wanted to use that movement uh, to increase their increase their, their their profit and one of the analysts i was working with he once mentioned that this is what what, what he said is doing well by doing good so meaning uh, through the consideration of esg uh, data, you could also increase your financial performance because the narrative was that P, uh, companies in the long run, they would, they would uh, outperform other companies if they would uh, look at certain environmental and social concerns. So ESG data became, really became a potential identifier to analysts and investors alike for potential outperformance. And most importantly, it was not perceived as something which they would call ideological or value driven uh, to them anymore, but simply as a matrix to, to, to analyze and, and, and judge uh, particular companies they wanted or didn't want to invest in and wanted to have an opinion on. So I'll come to my conclusion. Um, time, is, time is already running out. So uh, I, I, as I hope it became clear is that I really see ESG as a new kind of valuation regime, which was close or is closely bound to, to, to the financial crisis in the sense that it, uh, it, 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 it came out as a result to uh, integrate critical concerns about finance into the analysis. So instead of uh, kind of uh, building a dichotomy between what financial market participants do and their critical and, and critical voices from outside, they somehow through the application of ERC, uh, 
uh, the, the application of ESG, they created an instrument to kind of integrate these critical concerns and kind of deliver a solution to them saying, look, uh, you are critical about our environmental and social impact of certain companies. We have a solution for you. We have ESG. Um, we have ESG criteria, we have ESG investment, and we also think we, we, we integrate your critical concerns. Um, and through this, they even have become a tool of speculation that we've seen in the third phase. So people, people trying uh, to go for, for, for environmental friendly or socially uh, responsible investment, not for the sake to actually, to actually support this claim, but really make it a, a, a kind of vehicle to, uh, for outperformance to gain from it. So this is this is it for me. So to just basically, um, uh, I hope this gives uh, uh, an, an insight uh, how how our questions of sociality of social uh, so, uh, so social responsibility can be treated in market. And and my my stance is is really a rather critical one to be careful how these things can be reframed and integrated and, and finally make it a tool that helps them and not really the social concerns or the environmental concerns. So thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, we have now uh, about 10 minutes for, for questions or, or remarks. You can just raise your hand. Yes, uh, uh, Francois. Thank you very much. So sorry, I didn't have much time to really phrase my question. So sorry if I'm a bit messy when, uh, when I talk. But from what I understood, um, would you say that ESG, ESG would be like uh, somehow a patch to keep capitalism going? Like uh, somehow it's uh, an idea of cleaning some of uh, capitalism's mess, but uh, it's just, uh, just a way to keep it running. And um, uh, would you say also that there is a sort of, of a, a contradiction? And we, we talked about that uh, yesterday, and I think the, the, the term was, it was from Fabian, and uh, I think it's very interesting, the, the contradiction between uh, financial objectives, uh, meaning uh, financial returns, and uh, actual ESG uh, objectives. So uh, this contradiction would lead necessarily to a form of instrumentalization of, uh, of uh, ESG toward finance. Like, would you say this is true or this is true to, uh, too categorical? Well, I would be very happy to have your, your, your idea on that. Thanks you. And thanks for the, for the presentation. That was really fascinating. Thank you, Francois. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, I would absolutely say that it's true what you're saying. So, um, and this is this is something you know, like when when we talk, like in, in this context, I think we can take a critical stance. It's it's more difficult if we talk to a broader public because, of course, we want to. At least I would like to push the idea that environmental concerns and social concerns are somehow. Uh, taken seriously within financial markets among financial practitioners. But the critical twist to it is really that uh, the form that it is ref reframed in a way to, to help them is, is, is a bit of um, or what I'm trying to, to, to tell you about it, what, what, with, with this paper is really a, a kind of a Poltanski Capello story in a sense that the critique is integrated uh, uh, into the practices and then helps to strengthen the practices it, it, itself. So um, and this is something this is something that's clearly happening in my my um, in my view, view. So we should be careful about the dichotomies. Uh, between the economic and the and the non-economic, and we should also be very careful every time economists as and, and financial market practitioners start to talk about the environmental and social concern. So this will be the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, Noé with another question. Yeah, thank you, and uh, thank you, Stefan, for this very interesting uh, presentation. 
And in fact, uh, I was wondering, uh, isn't there a, a fourth phase, a fourth step, in fact, in which there are new uh, practices of uh, sustainable finance that kind of criticize uh, what uh, ESG is? I, I think of uh, impact investing because it is my, uh, my, sub, my uh, topic, but you know, when, I, when, when we speak with uh, impact investors, they say that um, ESG finance is too standardized, too mainstream, not efficient enough. And they use the term, for example, impact washing to speak of uh, uh, ESG investors who use the label impact investing uh, in their activities. So um, is there this, this new movement in which uh, uh, ESG is not considered uh, efficient anymore and uh, that we would need uh, something more radical? And uh, so mm -hmm. the, the, the cycle continues. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, you, I left out for, for, for the sake in this paper, uh, I really left out what's uh, basically the movement of impact investment, which, which you uh, wonderfully now summarized as, as, as also a critical response to what's going on in us, as what was going on in SRI and ESG. I mean, and, and this is this is truly interesting. So 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 I should have told you or, or, or since we talk about that, of course, you are absolutely right. So the critical reflection on ESG does not only come from academics or outsiders or critical NGOs and CSOs, it, it, there, there, there is, it also comes from within, namely from impact investor or, or anything that has to do with investment, investors, uh, investor activism, because ESG is not about uh, in, in investor activism. There is no, there, there's no activist uh, components. It's, 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 it's basically a, a technique of valuation, non-economic valuation. And the critique is definitely there. So, so I think, um, the, the, the story that I'm telling you, as you, as you mentioned for the full day, could be wonderfully be continued uh, with the integration of impact investment. Uh, it's just to be very blunt about it. I just don't have the data for that, but, uh, but of course it, it, it could go on or it should go on like that, absolutely. Thank you. I, I might have a, another question related to this. So, so do you think, do you think, think Stefan, that these different, I mean, these different labels or these different uh, notions that are circulating uh, in that community, are they also, are, are they attached to certain groups that are competing with, with each other, for example, in, in such a big bank that you have studied? So, so is there, you know, the, the ESG guys versus the impact uh, investment guys? So, so is, that, is that kind of a fight between different fractions within the bank and, and, and also a fight about who can impose themselves or is it is it as an analyst is it more a thing that comes and goes you know like is it, it is a new notion around you take it up and then after a few years you 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 can't use it anymore as a as a as a marketing tool uh, mm -hmm. also a way to 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 sell to sell uh, your, your your expertise so how does that work mm -hmm. yeah absolutely very interesting question or very interesting point you're you're, you're taking in um Absolutely. I mean, in, in, in the book, I talk a lot about narratives and, and, and the, the, the importance of narratives in financial markets. And definitely things like ESG and or impact investing, they are also, it's also about the competition, uh, competition between different narratives in the market and different or narrativized ways to participate or to become active in, in the market. And, and this is this is uh, true for the market uh, as such, your overall market between different institutions, but it's definitely also, as you mentioned, it's also true, true within the institutions. So, so during my time at, at Swiss, Swiss Bank, for example, there were really a number of analysts that were really pushing that topic, and there were others that were fully opposed to it and didn't really accept it as to a certain degree where they had to accept that it became a thing uh, among many people in the market and the Financial Times had a special issue on that and, and things, like, things like that. So it became a successful concept. So this, um, this 
this um, lifespan of, of, of concepts within the market is very interesting uh, to, to, to look at sociologically. And I would just uh, like to point to a, a particular paper from Leon Wonsleben that I like very much on the, on the concept of bricks as an investment tool. I think it was published in um, Journal for Cultural Economy, I think, or, uh, or yeah, and then and it's, it's, it's a wonderful paper where he described how, how the BRICS concept um, uh, became a successful concept of invest, uh, investment uh, emerging out of a particular uh, analyst team from Goldman Sachs and then became more successful and people started to take it up and start to, to, to um, invest accordingly. So you have the performative e effect of it there as well. So it's a wonderful paper if you're interested in, 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 these, um, in these stories of success or failure of particular concepts in financial markets. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. This was really uh, an interesting uh, presentation, and 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 all those who haven't read uh, Stefan's book, I really um, recommend it. It's it's a it's a wonderful, also I think a wonderful narrative. Uh, you, you're talking a lot about narratives, but it's really you. a kind of a follow up of all the stages of that of that uh, of that uh, profession of that that job that financial analysts do. So uh, very very thank well uh, written. So uh, we're going to me. the. Thank you for coming. So we have uh, our second guest, uh, who is uh, Lena Pellandini Simani. Uh, so Lena uh, did her PhD in sociology at the LSE. She also taught at the LSE. She worked in Budapest and now uh, is assistant professor. And I think for two weeks now, she has been tenured, is now associate professor uh, uh, at the University of Svizzera Italiana. So congratulations from our part, Lena. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she is interested in, in, in markets and moralities, and I think she has a very, uh, a very interesting research program, which, it, which is uh, both interested in the, in the organizations on the one hand, and, and, and then also the, the clients or, or the people that are uh, concerned by those uh, uh, products offered by these financial institutions. And she has a, a current um, uh, uh, research project, which is called Social Patterning of Economic Subjectivities and the Digital Transformation of Retail Finance in Switzerland. And if I understand you rightly, you, you, you're going to speak uh, uh, with a, a theoretical piece, a theorization of that, that topic uh, in, in your presentation now. So you have the floor for about uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, again. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, yes, I'm just a... I just have to <laughs> make sure that I see you in a... Okay. So, <clears throat> so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, as you said, my name is Lena Perlandini Shimani, and I work at the Università della Svizzera Italiana in Lugano, Switzerland. And uh, I will talk about um, studying the financialization of everyday life through the lens of class. So it's mainly a theoretical paper and a bit of a research agenda on how to bring a class into the financialization of everyday life uh, literature. So before I start, just a quick clarification of uh, what I mean by the financialization of everyday life. Uh, this term has been used mainly in two senses. One refers to the increasing use of financial products by households, and the other one to a new cultural outlook in everyday life, um, so the new economic uh, subjectivity. And in that sense, uh, it refers to rational financial planning, risk-taking, and entrepreneurial investorial mindset. So it mainly refers to cultural change, and it's in this sense that I'm going to use it in this uh, presentation. So how are financialized uh, subjectivities conceptualized in this financialization of everyday life uh, literature? So to understand that, uh, we have to focus on the core questions that this literature asks 
And these core questions center mainly around uh, neoliberalism and responsabilization in particular. And, uh, and the question is how people are made to accept neoliberalism. So how are they made to accept that the social services are cut, that more and more responsibility is delegated to, to them for their uh, pensions, health care, education, and uh, education, and so on, all of this happening uh, simultaneously to declining real wages. So how do they accept it? And how do they start to willingly participate in this process? And how are they governed in a liberal era that is marked by freedom? So these are the core questions. And uh, this literature's answer uh, to this question centers around uh, financialized subjectivities. So they draw mainly on Foucault and Foucault's uh, notion of governmentality. And what they suggest is that uh, that uh, autonomy is redefined as financial autonomy, freedom is redefined as uh, financial freedom. So, um, so all of these, um, uh, like financialization of everyday life is intertwined with uh, technologies of the self in the Foucauldian sense, so everyday ideas of autonomy, liberty, and freedom. And, um, and the financialization of everyday life involves self-disciplining mechanisms. So for example, when you want to maintain your credit rating, um, your credit score, you introduce self-disciplining mechanisms. So for them, financialized subjectivities are uh, an answer to these questions of how people come to accept neoliberalism and how are they governed. So for them, uh, the answer is that because they become financialized, they adopt a new financial subjectivity outlook in their everyday life. Now, this explanation is very compelling. However, uh, class and also other social categories are entirely or almost entirely missing. So also gender, ethnicity, uh, and so on. So um, what I'm trying to do in, in this uh, project that I will uh, tell you about and, and in this paper is finding ways to bring class into this kind of uh, literature focused on financial subjectivities. So to do that, we can reach back to older sociological uh, traditions that looked at uh, how economic subjectivities differ uh, across social class. Uh, first person that I think comes to everybody's mind is Wood <laughs> and his notion of the habitus and the economic uh, dispositions. Uh, just briefly, for Wood, uh, a class position uh, that limits different relations to money, savings, and rationality. Uh, class um, positions <laughs> determine pretty much the disposition to everything, including money, savings, uh, and rationality. And the mechanism for uh, Bourdieu that he explains uh, best probably in the distinction, but also in other books, is that uh, different objective conditions and, and the composition uh, of cultural capital lead to different uh, habitus. Um, and this explanation focuses on early socialization in the family. So this is when your original dispositions and habitus and also your relation to economic matters uh, develop. So this has very little to do with financialization. And I would say, no matter what kind of financialization happens in the world, this remains unchanged because it's so fixed uh, through the early years of socialization. However, there is another strand of Bourdieu's work, uh, for example, in the social structures of the economy, uh, which looks at uh, uh, banks and, and their clients uh, through the example of, um, focusing on the mortgage market. And here, what he explains is that it's not just that different clients approach the bank with different habituses, but also the bank relates to different clients and addresses different clients uh, in a different way. So here, not early socialization, but the institution, the bank, plays a key role in, a, in, a in the development of, of a class economic subjectivities. So here we have a, a different kind of uh, mechanism uh, which relates uh, to financial institutions broadly conceived um, in shaping class financial subjectivities. So this kind of research area started to develop uh, more uh, recently in various fields of uh, 
first of all, economic geography, uh, where we have the notion of financial ecologies uh, that uh, connects uh, geography with class. So mainly in the work of uh, and relation, we have a uh, uh, working class neighborhoods, uh, middle class, upper class neighborhoods, and how they are served differently by banks, and how uh, uh, they develop different financial uh, ecologies <clears throat> in the sense of also different financial subjectivities are fostered by these different relations through banks. Uh, even more importantly, from an economic uh, sociology point of view, we have uh, the work of uh, Fursad and Haley, who talk about classification uh, situations. And, uh, and these classification situations refer to the fact that, uh, well, I'm now only talking about uh, the aspects that refer to financial institutions. It's a broader argument, but the part that refers to financial institutions is that they classify people into different categories based on a wide range of sociodemographic para parameters, including class, but not only. So also behavioral parameters, uh, attitudinal financial literacy. And they argue that these kind of parameters are even more fine-tuned than earlier analysis of class. So these things matter because uh, these classifications, so into which category you have been classified, uh, form the basis of exclusion and inclusion into particular financial services. So whether you get a mortgage or you don't, whether you can um, um, invest into a certain um, profitable financial product or you can't and so on. And also for the conditions at which these uh, services are given. So whether you pay 1% interest rate on a loan or you pay 10. So obviously these uh, eligibility processes produce different objective uh, life chances. So just to go back to the previous example, if you have to pay 1% on your mortgage as opposed to if you have to pay 10%, it's a very objective <laughs> financial influence on your life. Also, whether you can get, get a mortgage on a house or you can't. So these uh, eligibility uh, processes, so to which category you are classified, they produce objective uh, life chances. So according to Fursad and Haley, uh, they become new vehicles of class formation, and that's why we need to study them. So they focus specifically on um, eligibility, but extending this argument further, uh, classifications uh, shape class beyond eligibility. So if we look at financial institutions, we find that classifications, mainly in the form of segmentation, are also used in marketing, but most importantly in financial product design. So they segment the market and they design different financial products for the different social groups that they identified, and also in the digital interface uh, design. So most of the, um, the financial products now are increasingly being acquired through digital interfaces. So web, websites, apps, you apply for a mortgage, you apply for a loan, you use a website. But even if you go to a bank branch, the advisor uses a computer to assess uh, what kind of products they can advise you and also how to advise you. So the comparison paper, uh, comparison table that you will see is printed out using a specific software. So the, the segmentation process is the classifications that are used in a financial institution uh, determine all of these uh, processes. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and bring in Calon and, uh, and combine this insight uh, with the Calonian um, sociology, uh, which is also prevalent in other uh, branches uh, of the social studies of finance and so on. So I just want to bring in one particular argument of Calon uh, that he developed first in the, in the laws of the market. And in this um, introduction and later on in other papers, he suggested that uh, rationality is not the quality of the actor, but it's something that arises through what he called in that chapter prosthesis. Later on, uh, he called it devices that allow for rational calculation. Um, these devices don't only allow for rational calculation, but actually they take over rational uh, calculation from the actors. So they, they make rational choices on users' behalf. 
um, they assume specific kind of rational subjects and they make the calculations on behalf of these subjects. So for example, if uh, you think about sky scanner, it's a, it's a typical device that makes the rational calculation for you. You introduce, you enter where you wanna go and when, and then it calculates like what's the best option for you, not just the cheapest, not just the fastest, but what's the best. You are not even sure what the rational calculation it's, um, it's performing on your behalf. Now, if we extend it to financial products, if you want to get a payday loan, you can use this app that, um, that allows you to enter uh, how much money you want, and then it calculates the best um, uh, loan for you. If you want to uh, invest, you can use an investment app. Now, all of this is, all, um, all of this is compatible with what Fallon says, but what I want to highlight here on this slide is that the kind of rationality that the app or the website assumes is not entirely the same depending on what kind of product you use. So the payday loan up here uh, that you see that is targeted at, at the lower class, the poorest uh, consumers, it's very simple. It takes over almost all of the decision from you. Whereas the investment app targeted at, uh, yes, targeted at, uh, at upper class, um, uh, consumers, it's much more complicated. It encourages much more calculation. It also, they also differ in the kind of rationality that they assume. So the investment that assumes that you want to um, maximize your wealth in the long run, whereas uh, the payday loan app assumes that you want the most money possible now and you don't really care about the future. So they assume different kinds of uh, time horizons and different kinds of rationalities. So the reason why it's important is because uh, Kalman says that market devices prefigure specific rational subjects. And uh, what we see on closer look is that different rationalities are assumed and offered to different social groups. So to conclude uh, this paper, I want to argue that it's useful to connect the financialization of everyday life literature with processes of class formation. And to do that, we have to recognize that, yes, the financialization of everyday life literature is right in saying that there is a general push towards the financialization of everyday life, the adoption of financialized subjectivities. However, we should also recognize that this is not a homogeneous push. And that's because financial institutions' assumptions of rationality, of financial priorities, and of economic subjectivities more broadly differ across financial services targeted at different social groups. So the social pattern, not necessarily the class pattern, because this is not always a class kind of segmentation that they use, the social pattern of economic subjectivities and financial behaviors is increasingly co-produced by segmentation, eligibility, and product design processes. So the subjectivities of different social groups are scripted differently into these different financial products. So, so according to these, uh, bringing these theories together means that these are becoming key sites of producing social patterns of economic subjectivities. So the research agenda that I'm, I'm trying to propose and, and that uh, we are following in the current SNF project is to focus on financial institutions of segmentation that affects the eligibility conditions, product design, and so on, and to look at the assumptions of economic subjectivities uh, across the different segments and how they differ, and how financial products are scripted that are offered to different groups. So this is the basically what we are trying to do in this uh, SNF project. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. Um, for this uh, for this presentation, very interesting. So um, I just have to find my icon. Um, yes, so uh, the, the floor is open for um, for questions or remarks. Uh, Stefan. Yes, thanks a lot, Lena. It's truly interesting, and I'm excited to see what. Uh, what you will find out or how the, how the project will be evolving because it's, as I understood, just about to start, right? And I uh, think uh, it's, 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 it's an amazing project. So really, 
really looking to forward hearing more from it. So can you can you say just uh, to, for clarification some of the empirical cases that are involved in the project? So I'd be interested in that. Uh, that's the first first question, and the second one is a link to that, of course. Will cryptocurrencies play a role? Because I think, like in um, in the in the context of class, they could be quite interesting. And this is not something I don't have a particular expertise uh, on it. But I think with the run on bitcoins that we've seen during the last few months, I I, I feel like I, I have the feeling that many people independent from class want at least want to join or are joining this investment movement so so i'd like to hear your thoughts on that yes yes i, I completely agree also like uh, the reddit movement of lay investors <laughs> sort of <laughs> crash the market. Uh, so in this project, we are not looking specifically at uh, cryptocurrencies. We have three case cases that we are focusing on. Um, one is payday loans uh, that is targeted typically at the poorest part of the population. Um, investment services that are targeted at the uh, highest echelon of the of, of the upper class and mortgages that in Switzerland is like upper middle class upwards so middle and uh, upper upper class uh, that said uh, cryptocurrencies are part of the the investment uh, portfolio in some of the investment services so um, we will have a different uh, investment service uh, providers uh, apps and in some of them you can have a cryptocurrency but uh, the kind of result that you were hinting at will not come out from that because most of the, the investment uh, app uh, or website services in Switzerland, they require a minimum amount of, uh, of um, assets. So poor people are not able to, to use them. So unfortunately, <laughs> uh, that kind of finding will not, not come out from from the project. Is there other questions? I mean, one question I had is, is a bit the, I mean, it's the classical, the classical marketing, the classical marketing questions in a sense. So, so are, are the, I mean, I mean, these 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 banks they they want to conquer, I guess, new uh, new market shares. They want to they want to sell new stuff, and they, they they kind of adapt themselves to the public in a certain way. So I guess in order to sell things, you have to go you have to to go and see the the needs of the public and and kind of sell sell them what they want, you know, in in a certain way. Um, yeah. And and the other the other thing is more your your approach where you're saying yeah well you have to shape them first you have to you have to um, you have to you have to create maybe also those those subjectivities that are that are then uh, kind of um, um, yeah that, that 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 would would want to to uh, to to, um, to to buy these these uh, these uh, services yeah. so how is how is that so in in practice it's not that much either or. Because yes, every bank wants to sell stuff that people want, but how do you get to know what people want is a is a tricky process. <laughs> because in um, so yes, you can use market research, but in in uh, many banks, also in Switzerland, even though it's like you know they have a lot of money, often they don't use market research; they just use their intuition of like what kind of things people would want in my opinion. So they just make these assumptions of, uh, of what people want. And even when they do market research, it's not like that you can, um, I mean, the market research tools are not innocent in the sense that, uh, that you have to, like when you give a brief to a market research agency, you, you have to tell them like what kind of clients you want more or less, what kind of questions they should be asked. So the assumptions about the client, the clients, they sort of like 
they are everywhere in the product development process. You can't really just go there and see what people want. Also, because in this market, people don't want anything <laughs> in, the, in the sense that it's, a, it's like a, a newly emerging market. So you are just hoping that, that you will offer it to them and then they will want it. So for example, um, many of these uh, sites, they offer uh, education services to people because they assume that, that people would want to get rich, but they don't realize that they need to learn these things. So, so many of the Swiss websites, they're both investment service and financial education websites. So it's like... A... Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have two more questions. So I saw Francois and Lena. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'll go really quick because actually I think you answered most of the question I had because it was really in line with Felix's. Um, I was wondering if we're looking here into the um, um, uh, cons consumer's parts and the consumer activity into shaping the product that they will uh, receive somehow because normally banks and everything they have to adapt to what they want, but uh, you already explained how they did it. But I was wondering if there is also other ways that they could be active in the way they form the product that they will, uh, that they will uh, be offered. Yes, so uh, the research will also include uh, consumers and observations of uh, their interactions with these products. Um, and we will see how much agency they, <laughs> they want to have, like how, how much resistance or, or what happens in these interactions. Also, uh, different products uh, allow for different uh, level of, of agency for the, for the consumer. And, uh, and we want to have a look a little bit with that, at that too. Um, I already did like, um, like 20 interviews, like pilot interviews. For the moment, I'm very skeptical because <laughs> I saw that <laughs> there will be like a lot of market research, a lot of feedback and, you know, and for the moment, I'm not really seeing any of it. So it's really just very old school. I think this is what people want and I hope it will work. If it doesn't, I give them some financial literacy education so that they come and match my idea of them. <laughs> so, so it's not, not really working in the marketing textbook way. It's working more in the old school production driven <laughs> way, but we will see. Yeah, I see. Thank, thank you very much. It, it's fascinating. I think this project is, is great and I'm really looking forward to, to see how it develops. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We have uh, another question from Lena Aydacic. Yeah, so I'm not used to hear so many times Lena. <laughs> Me neither. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I have uh, one question, uh, which is maybe a bit um, unclear, but so for me, uh, at the end of the presentation, I wasn't exactly sure anymore about the role of class in the research, because I think um, so uh, there are certain domains of financialization where I see a very clear link to class. For example, uh, the practices of, of credit, um, loan provision, et cetera, by banks. Uh, but these applica the application examples that you've uh, highlighted, I would, I, would I, I, like, I would suppose that the other um, uh, characteristics, social characteristics are more central, like uh, age and ability to use um, I don't know, uh, applications, um, uh, maybe the gender more so than class. So uh, I wanted to just re-ask, so where exactly or how important is class uh, in, in this part of the, of the project? Um, and then another vague question <laughs> uh, was um, about the presentation of Michelle Lamont yesterday. So she highlighted uh, basically um, the trend towards other dimensions of, uh, value, of val valuation and of solidarity and of uh, um, uh, ideologies that are important in social life, which uh, basically she says are in contrast to these neoliberal uh, types of valuations that have been dominant up to now. And she says the Generation Z is now focusing on um, uh, individual uh, diversity and liberty and mental health and so on. So um, the, your project would, 
if I interpret it correctly, be a bit in opposition with the trends that uh, Michel Lamont observes? Or what would you say about that? OK, so for the first question, uh, where is class? Uh, it's an empirical question. So uh, one thing that is coming out from Fursad and Haley's argument is that, uh, is that uh, these uh, classification situations no longer reflect class. They reflect class, but also other things. And we have to empirically study what kind of uh, social groupings these financial institutions are using, because the kind of groupings that they use uh, have an effect on the actual, like they are performing a social structure. So I'm coming uh, from uh, this uh, tradition and, uh, and I'm interested empirically in what kind of uh, like categories uh, financial institutions use and whether those categories have any sort of uh, effect on the actual social structure of society. I just want to note in brackets that, uh, that uh, yeah, um, class and any social classification is a multidimensional um, concept. And I'm not looking at financial uh, inequality. There is like excellent research looking at financialization and how it affects financial inequality. I'm looking at more like a Weberian kind of uh, um, like class sub subjectivity, so the social patterning of, of, um, of subjectivity and, and what kind of patterns emerge in that. So, class, um, so it's an empirical question, whether, it, whether they are using class or other classifications, and if they're using other classifications, what are those classifi classifications that are going to shape uh, the social patterns of our society now? So it's like, uh, it's not just class, it's also other things. Uh, regarding your, your second question, whether uh, this argument goes, um, like how it relates to, to Michel Lamont's argument, uh, there is a, a debate in sociology, like um, uh, in um, Greta Krippner's uh, more recent work on whether these kind of classifications that, uh, that uh, banks or like, in the field of that are used in the field of finance, whether they can be the basis of new kind of solidarities, and uh, and her earlier argument uh, was that that these break the traditional solidarities precisely because they are not class based. So the people who are dispossessed by the financial system, they have no way of finding each other and to form a common platform because it's not class based. It's sort of um, uh, an algorithm that nobody understands. However, more recent research, also her more recent research, and also my previous research on, on, a, on a mortgage, evicted mortgage borrowers, uh, we are finding that partly thanks to social media, these people find each other and they are able to find, um, they are able to form common platforms around like shared vulnerabilities and, and shared um, 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 like social problems such as being evicted. So it's, a, it's again something that is happening now. We don't have a clear cut answer to that, uh, whether it, it can be a new basis of solidarity. I tend to be optimistic <laughs> based on my research that yes, it, it can, although like with all social movements, sometimes they don't address the root cause of the problem. Sometimes they go towards conspiracy theories and, and you know, like not the real problem, but, um, but they form solidarities. I don't know whether it makes sense. Solidarities are formed, social movements are formed, but they don't address the root cause. They address some like imaginary, uh, um, conspiracy theory enemy, but um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. So this was very interesting. And, and we, we, of course, hope to, to see you again uh, soon. So in order to, 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 to learn more about uh, your empirical um, results that you find. So uh, we, we go to the, the third okay. uh, speaker of this afternoon. So this is uh, Fabien Fourault. So Fabien did his PhD in sociology at, the, at Sciences Po in Paris. He works as a post-doctoral uh, researcher 
in the project on financial elites that we do here at the University of Lausanne together also with Lena Aydacic. Uh, he has published his, um, his, uh, his doctoral uh, research. He's a, he's a specialist on private equity. And so his book is called Le Capital en Action, Comment les fonds d'investissement prennent le contrôle des entreprises. So it's, a, it's an analysis of, of the private equity uh, movement in, in, in France. Uh, uh, and he will present today a part of our current research project uh, on financial elites, where he shows how US upper classes use uh, patrimonial elements, patrimonial organizations, categories, in part, in order to defend themselves against the uh, rational bureaucracy uh, and the generalizations of, uh, of meritocratic mechanisms. So uh, Fabien, you have the floor also for about 15 minutes, and we're looking forward to the, to the discussion afterwards. Thank you, Felix. Um, I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everybody see? Can everybody see what's on my screen? Yeah, sure. Okay, so first of all, thank you to everybody for listening to me now. Um, the paper I'm going to present is uh, from our project uh, here at the University of Lausanne with uh, with Lena Idaktic and uh, Felix Bullman. It is, um, it is about, um, okay, I'm going to make it more. Okay, better now. It is about financialization, which we define as the uh, greater importance of finance in uh, social life. Here we have a graph of the, um, share of the finance sector in GDP in several countries. And you can see that financialization is most of all uh, a phenomenon characteristic of uh, Anglo-American economies and the US especially. Um, and here in the project and in the paper, we are focusing mostly on the people that are driving these, this trend. So well, the, these people are at the top of the biggest financial institutions, and we call them the financial elite. So the starting point of this paper is actually uh, two recent research, uh, two, res two basic facts uh, uh, from recent research. The first one is the fact that in the US economy now, there is the rise of uh, non-corporate forms of organizations. These are the old partnerships uh, forms and uh, hybrids between partnerships and corporate forms, uh, such as the limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, and limited liability companies. We lump them together into the, these hybrid firms. Um, some authors, Sonner and Now, show that the, these firms are overly represented in uh, the finance uh, sector. And they are mostly owned by people with specific characteristics, uh, such as wealthy people, uh, whites, and also married uh, persons. The second fact that we rely on is the importance of um, ascriptive criteria of, uh, for elite reproduction. Um, this was es especially uh, shown by uh, Megan Tobias Neely. She wants to explain the very high proportion of uh, people with characteristics such as being white and being male on top of uh, financial institutions. And especially she studies the, um, the hedge fund industry, which is supposed to be this very, very modern, uh, very modern um, industry. And uh, her explanation is that uh, in these uh, firms, you have certain hiring, grooming and seating practices that favor these type of uh, people uh, that can then reach the top of these organizations. And these two research streams are uh, connected by the notion of uh, patrimonialism, uh, which is um, different from uh, the logic of bureaucracy and meritocracy. Uh, Megan Tobias Neely defines uh, uh, patrimonialism as an organization of authority in which a leader assumes power through networks based on trust, loyalty, and tradition. And the basic idea of the paper is to try to verify this idea of, um, of patrimonialism. 
but in fact, it may be more complicated than that because it's not a return. We don't see the return to uh, uh, pre-modern forms of social organizations like pure patrimonialism. Uh, in fact, in finance, uh, we may see the rise of uh, what we can call neo-patrimonialism, which combines with uh, bureaucracy. And this neo-patrimonialism uh, logic would be um, would rest on certain organizational forms, these hybrid firms that we that I spoke about, that um, that uh, themselves rely on a mechanism of elite reproduction based on trust networks, and that, so that it favors homogeneous uh, characteristics of leaders. And these firms might be more characteristics of certain segments of the financial sector, such as alternative finance. Uh, in hedge funds and private equity firms, and not in other ones, more bureaucratic sectors, bureaucratized sectors, such as investment banks and asset uh, managers. So the analytic strategy that we use to verify this uh, neo patrimonial hypothesis is a quantitative study of uh, financial elites, of the social backgrounds of these financial elites. The neo patrimonial hypothesis we want to uh, address is the fact that with the emergence of uh, partnerships and hybrid organizational forms, um, you, this, this emergence of these new forms favor the reproduction of traditional elites at the helm of US finance. And by traditional elites, we mean, we mean uh, white, male, and uh, high social status uh, people. And we decompose this hypothesis into three sub-hypotheses. The first one is, the fact that hybrid firms would be dominant uh, in hedge funds and private equity. The second one is that the founders of uh, financial firms would have higher chances of uh, being drawn from these groups. So higher chances of being white, male, and from an Ivy League university, which we take as a proxy of uh, high social status. And third hypothesis, the, the top managers uh, in hybrid firms would have also higher chances of being white, being male, and being a graduate from Ivy League University if we compare them to uh, the more bureaucratic firms. We, we rely on two types of data. The first one is the data from a um, business database called Orbis on uh, the firm foundings uh, uh, in the last three decades. And the second type of data is, uh, is from an original database that we have built in the project uh, which uh, in the paper contains, uh, it's, a, it's a subsample of 40 firms and 80, uh, um, uh, 80 hundred managers and directors of these firms. So the first hypothesis, um, here you have a graph that uh, plots the proportion of hybrid forms in, in, in total incorporations in the US. And we see that uh, indeed, uh, the uh, hybrid firms are dominant and growing in hedge funds and in private equity, but not in banks. Um, and they are also growing actually in uh, asset manager in um, asset management, which is a little bit was a little bit surprising to me. But anyways, the second uh, hypothesis um, we we try to test it with the logistic regression with the dependent variable of uh, being, uh, being a founder of a firm versus being not a founder of a firm. And we see that uh, males have higher chances of being founders, approximately 6% more chance. White people also have uh, more chance of being a founder of a firm. And the theory doesn't work for Ivy League uh, graduates. And the third hypothesis we test it with the also logistic regression with a dependent variable being, being on top of a hybrid firm versus on top of a public firm, public firm meaning like big uh, firm listed on the stock market, bureaucratic firm. And we see that indeed um, in uh, hybrid firms, um, the founders have other, sorry, the top, Top persons have higher chance of being male, 10% more chance of being male, 10% more chance of being white, and 10% more chance of uh, having graduated from an Ivy League university. So to conclude, I would say that um, 
the new patrimonial hypothesis works uh, works actually uh, quite well. Um, so to Megan Tobias Neely might uh, be and her theory might be uh, might be very very uh, accurate. We see that um, partnerships and hybrid organizational forms tend to favor the reproduction of traditional elites in West finance, so being male, white, and with an Ivy League background. In terms of the historical implication of this theory, um, we can advance the fact that financialization combines a bureaucracy with uh, these neo patrimonialism. And in fact, neo patrimonialism may be, um, uh, I would say, um, a, counter, a counter tendency uh, um, of, of bureaucracy. I mean, we, de we defend this uh, historical narrative a little bit more in detail in the paper. And also the theoretical implication might be the, the fact that um, we, are, um, we are trying to speak to different, um, different literatures that don't, does not necessarily speak to each other, such as the literature on organizations, organizational forms, the literature on elite, uh, elites, uh, elite theory, and also uh, the literature on, um, on interse intersectionality. Okay, so I will leave it here. Thank you for your attention. And you have here some, um, some, uh, some references and the paper, you can read it. Uh, it's on Sox Axiv and it was published uh, recently. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, um, Fabien. I, I am having some problems here with my, com I don't know if it's my computer or the, or the network, but I, I didn't always hear you. And I had some problem to uh, activate my microphone. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, the floor, the, the floor is open for, for questions, for uh, remarks, for... Um, Stefan, you have a question? Yes, it's more of a remark or two short remarks. So thanks, Fabien. Uh, I think this is an amazing, amazing project. And also the very fact that you're uh, approaching this mainly in uh, through quantitative methods, it's, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a great plus because I think still, as far as I can see, like the financialization literature and you, Lena, you, you will know more about that than I do. But uh, I think there is still, I mean, it's one of the challenges that we, that we, we, we have this methodological gap and, and people, people or it, it, it works with, with, with different reference points and this almost discourse around uh, whether you're approaching it in, from the qualitative side or quantitative side so this project mainly is kind of bridges the gaps in many ways so so thanks for that uh one short remark is, is just uh about um uh, since you mentioned bureaucracy a lot and i think it's it's it's, it's very interesting in your project but also beyond uh, the work of uh, of david graber of course comes to mind uh for, for, for me as an anthropologist and i think there are quite some links to your 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 project so my my suggestion would just be or a remark would just be to 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 really consider graver's work in, in in your work as well i think it could be of great help yes thank you um it's um uh thank you for the, regarding the first remark yes um um there may be a gap in the financialization literature, um, but um, there is some quantitative works, but and there are also a lot of uh, qualitative works, ethnography and uh, interviews. I'm also doing I'm doing mixed method actually, so I'm like a bit schizophrenic, but um, <laughs> but um, um, these literature don't speak really to each other, and that's uh, I think that's a, a bit of um, a shame. Um, and for the um, for the and actually what I tried to do I didn't do it here in the presentation I could do it but uh, I like to take examples and to embody the, the the figures the numbers with actual 
actual people that I can describe soci sociologically. Um, I could do that for, for another presentation. Um, and the remark for bu of bureaucracy, I read the book of David Graeber, um, but um, I'm not tot totally convinced by his argument. And actually our paper might be a counter argument to his argument. He says that the bureaucracy like has invaded everything like, um, and it's like these, these big overarching uh, logics now. Whereas we are saying, no, I mean, if you look at finance, you have some, some parts of finance, some segments that are not driven by the bureaucratic logics, but by uh, these new patrimonial logics. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm, get, I'm going to do this without camera, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it works better, I think. Um, uh, Lena, you had a question. Yes, um, I have uh, two questions. One is uh, methodological. So uh, if you are saying that, uh, that uh, the bureaucratic logic is based on meritocracy, uh, how can you make sure that the Ivy League is a patrimonial logic and not a meritocratic one? So arguably, Ivy League is maybe, you yeah. know, very good, <laughs> there is a um, possibility. Uh, and the other one was a uh, like theoretical question of, uh, uh, I really liked uh, the idea and I liked the whole paper very much. And I really liked also this idea of combining the two logics. So like theoretically, how, how can you combine the two logics and how can you measure, for example, that uh, everybody's white male, but within them, there is a meritocracy. <laughs> so, so sort of this double thing that if you are a woman and non-white, you can't enter, but, as, but once you are white and male, then you are allowed to compete. So this sort of double things that there is a sort of entry barrier based on ethnicity, gender, and, and uh, education. But once you cross that entry barrier, it's meritocratic. Is there a way to somehow measure that or are you suggesting that? Or... So regarding the first question, um, the Ivy League variable is not a, it's not a measure of, um, of uh, uh, university um, how do you say, achievement. Uh, it's a measure of a specific type of university. So in the, in the paper, I take the example of uh, Harvard, which is part of the Ivy League, and the MIT, which is not part of the Ivy League. Those are, are two institutions that have approximately the same level of, uh, of um, how do you say, uh, same level of uh, edu edu education uh, achievement, but one is part of the Ivy League and the other is not part of the Ivy League. So the Ivy League is a plus, it's a sign, it's a symbol, it's a sign of prestige, it's a plus, it's a, it's a, it's a symbolic capital um, that you have when you, when you are from these universities. And regarding the second question, um, so the, actually we combine the two logics we say they are, um, they are uh, instantiated in different, uh, in different fields of finance and in different types of organizations. So we see that overall in finance, it's true that uh, it's dominated by um, male, by white persons, and also over over also the people from Ivy universities are over Within finance, you see differences uh, you see, even even in this high level of uh, homogeneous um, reproduction, you see differences according to the logics. So, for example, in the in the hybrid firms, you see overrepresentation, even more overrepresentation of these uh, uh, traditional elites. Did I understand you correctly, or? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there other questions? Okay, this is 
seems not to be the case. I was, uh, I, I mean, we have uh, five minutes left at this stage. So I was, um, um, yeah, maybe I just, uh, well, I, I was uh, in this in this place, maybe yeah, the, 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 one of the, the hopes that we had, and I think they, it was really uh, well fulfilled in a certain way was, was yeah, to bring together some, some people who work on, on, on the financial fields in different, in different ways and to, to, uh, to, to be very, very open. But I think, I think uh, it's really worth, and I hope that we can find other, uh, other places, other opportunities in, in, in the future to, to discuss these things together because uh, uh, we had sometimes a bit this, this impression that even though the finance and the financial place Financial centers are very, very much important for the Swiss, uh, for the Swiss um, economy. Um, th th there was not a coherent uh, or homogeneous group that that is kind of interacting with each, with each other, and, and and many people kind of remain in their uh, disciplinary or, 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 or the theoretical um, sub subgroups. And and I think it would it would be nice to have from time to time a kind of a, a get together of all those different people who. Um, work on these topics and I, I really find it very very instructive to, to have uh, yeah also this morning uh, a team was here from from history from anthropology from from sociology so uh, uh, if you're interested in those things we have the last uh, hour of our um, paper panels uh, tomorrow uh, again at 10 45 uh, so if you want to come to this uh, we have uh, three more papers uh, one with uh, Niels Neumann, uh, Olivier Gutschow, uh, Lena Aydacic, and also, um, I'm forgetting the last one, sorry about this, but uh, we have uh, three more uh, interesting papers tomorrow, so we hope to see you there. There are some more questions, I think. Okay. Are there more, are there uh, more, uh, Daniel, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My question is for Stefan, actually. Um, I wanted to ask you, Stefan, um, on the relationship between the ESG uh, analyst or ESG investor you, you analyzed, the relationship with morality, actually. How do they... Um, how do they perceive morality? Do they reject the term morality itself? Uh, or do they accept it? And uh, more precisely, if you ask them uh, why ESG investing is moral, what kind of uh, justification do you get from them implicitly if you, if you want, even, even if they don't use the term morality or, uh, um, or such terms, uh, how will they justify what they do morally? Thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, tricky question. like. I I think I have to first have to start by saying that there are many of them, not all of them, I'm talking about the analysts that, I'm, that I worked with, many of them uh, quite strictly uh, separate their personal life or their personal identity, if you want to call it as, as such, and their professional identity. So uh, if you talk to them uh, uh, as, a, as, 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 as on a personal level, they would of course use things like morality and they would reflect on their profession also in moral categories, very much so. Uh, if you talk about, uh, if you talk with them in, in in, in, in the function, in the role as professional analysts, they would really like, um, they wouldn't use terms like, or they don't like terms like morality or value or, or, or ideology or something, something like that at all. So they would really shy away from these kind of things. And they would maybe argue that this is something which has to be negotiated outside the realm of finance somehow. So they say they wouldn't say it's a bad thing, but they say this is not this is not what finance is about. We are about um, it is about to look for economically beneficial, profitable uh, opportunities. This is what finance is about. So mm -hmm. so it's kind of what and and then of course it just. Uh, as an ongoing thought, you can think about um, 
finance itself as a moral pro project, if you think about the history of ideas, uh, namely going back to, you know, like, you, I mean, you have Mondavin's Fable of the Bees, so, so kind of the, the idea that if, if, if everybody acts in a fully self-interested way, it's, it's better for the community overall. And if somebody tries to be social, actually creates, it creates effects that are not so social at all. Um, so that, that will be a different analytical kind of, of take. But, but, but coming back to the, to the analysts, like in their professional eye, they don't, professional self, they don't like to, to talk about morality uh, at all, but this doesn't need, and uh, this doesn't implicate that as persons they 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 think about moral things or they they like the category of morality to to explain certain things. Does that answer your question? Yes, and it it, uh, it it's exactly what we analyze in uh, impact investing in Geneva. It's a uh, uh, so it's not so much different in that regard. They don't like to talk about uh, morality, even if they use, uh, for that matter, a very moral um, language. But they they kind of like values. For them, it's okay. Values can be. We can talk about values. I respect your values. I have my values. But definitely not morality or ethics or anything like that. I yeah yeah. Uh, so I mean, this is this is just so so charged and. Uh, yeah. And, and I think we shouldn't make the mistake to kind of conclude from their professional practices that in their private sphere they don't they don't operate with these things. I mean, I had to, it's, it's from 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 my research for on commodity trade. I had a very interesting talk with with a commodity trader where we talked about these things, and all of a sudden he told he, he looked at me and said and said, but Stefan. I have two kids at home. Do you think I don't collect waste, or you know, I don't? I'm not concerned in the environmental future uh, of my family, of 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 this place. And here we really have to differentiate uh, between the professional uh, life and their personal lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. We we were told about two minutes ago that we have uh, still five minutes. So we would have, have two, two more minutes if there is another question. But, uh, well, maybe if I can ju jump in quickly with the last one <laughs> for yeah. uh, a quick question for, for Fabien. It's just, um, how do you prepare in the potential uh, comments of reviewers on the fact that you don't have the social class of regions of, uh, of your individuals. And actually it relates to what Lena said earlier. Like, um, I think your, your uh, proxy for the social class of origin is the, um, the university they went in, basically. Um, implicitly making the assumption that if uh, they have the same level of, uh, of education, but the, the difference is the type of university they're in, then if it's a prestigious one, they are coming from the upper class than the other. But uh, if, uh, if reviewers are not convinced by, by that, uh, that proxy, uh, which is um, uh, a, a long one somehow, um, what, what would, you, would you answer? Um, Ivy League graduation, to me, is not a proxy for social class of origin, but more like social status, which is different. Uh, social class of origin, I would like to measure it directly by knowing the father's profession, but uh, this uh, information is very difficult to find. So, so it's social status, which is a contemporary thing, not like a uh, uh, um, thing coming from the past. At one point okay. in time, you have high social status because you graduated, you graduated from this university. But you, you could also say that, I mean, we know from these, from certain studies of, of the elite university in the US that class is actually the, 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 only, the only thing uh, uh, where, where, where so, so, so working class is still quite systematically excluded from access to, to these universities. So it's not the case for race. It's no longer the case for gender and for religious 
uh, uh, for example, the Jews have been integrated, have also been excluded at a certain time in history and then have been integrated over the, uh, over the 20th century. But if you still look at, 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 uh, at today's composition of, of, the, of the students, you still see that, uh, for example, working class uh, students are quite systematically excluded. Thank you. Um, okay. I, I just wanted to say that I like this idea that uh, we could maybe have an exchange later at a later point in time with these people, um, these diverse research groups working on the topic of uh, financialization in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. I definitely hope there's, there's other opportunities to, to meet. Okay, so thank you very much for, for this uh, interesting uh, discussion, debate uh, with the three presentations. Thank you very much to the three uh, presenters and uh, we hope to see you soon, maybe tomorrow, but uh, otherwise uh, uh, over these uh, next, next years uh, on these topics. So thank you and- uh, Thank you everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone. Yeah, that was fun. Take care, bye. Bye-bye.